So I gave a talk at uh, the Refugee Board for the Refugee Protection Division, so not the guys that Jean was just talking about, but the people who make refugee status decisions. Uh, in the spring at a training session about credibility determination, my, that's my, my work is in, at the intersection of psychology and law, looking at uh, how the board members make credibility decisions and how they should make credibility decisions. And so I was, I was asked to talk and I was preparing to give my sort of usual spiel about the psychology of memory and risk perception and all this kind of stuff. And then I learned that the other person on my panel was a police detective who runs the interrogation course at police college. And by Google stalking him, I figured out that he, apparently he likes to talk to audiences, police audiences, about the science of lie detection. Uh, and the science of lie detection is an area that I research in. And so, you know, ironically, for the purposes of today's conference, uh, the science of lie detection is not the technology of sort of machine-assisted lie detection, but just the psychology of questioning somebody and watching them answer and figuring out whether they're telling the truth or not. Um, so I rewrote my talk to try to make one essential point to the board members, which is that the science of lie detection is an utterly fascinating area of study that has nothing to offer the refugee board. <laughs> Part of my talk was about the fact that there is a fundamental legal problem with using methods based on the science of lie detection to interrogate refugee claims. Uh, but in my minutes today, what I want to talk about is the other problem that I was raising, which is that the weakest of the scientific lie detection methods simply misuse the research. And the strongest may be useful in other contexts, but rest on assumptions that don't hold in a refugee hearing. And so I'll take you quickly through four of the main kinds of allegedly scientific lie detection methods, starting with the weakest, and that's the one in my title, which is you've probably seen on Facebook posts or sort of out and about in the world, these you know, top five ways to spot a liar. Right? Um, they're all over Facebook, but they're also just sort of in popular media. They're uh, in TED Talks and police training materials. And these kinds of posts typically make claims about what researchers have discovered, about how we behave when we're lying. And the problem is that these claims typically conflate and confuse two concepts coming from two different fields of study. Researchers who study deception, who are interested in cognition, have been largely focused in recent years on testing two theories. The first is the theory that when we lie, we feel more anxiety and fear and shame than we do when we're telling the truth, and that these emotions leak out in how we act. So to test this theory, researchers will run studies to see, for example, if liars fidget more often, right? if they touch their faces more, um, if they take sort of defensive postures. The second theory is that it takes more mental energy to lie. Liars have to keep their stories straight. They have to sort of put some work in to try to look truthful. And so to test this theory, or this sort of bundle of theories, researchers run studies to see whether liars, for example, take longer to answer questions, or make more pauses, or use more um kind of noises, or trip over their words more often, things that might indicate that cognitive load, that they're using more resources. And when researchers see patterns emerging that suggest that truth tellers and liars are acting differently along these kinds of lines, what they want to know is how significant is that difference? Right? So what are the chances that it's just a random variation? Because if it isn't random, then it, it may provide some support for the theory that they're testing. So that's one body of research. Another body of research is lie detection research. And when lie detection researchers are looking at the same body of experimental findings, they're looking for something different. The theories that they want to test are theories about how to catch liars. So they're not simply interested in whether a difference is significant or not. For a start, they're interested in whether a decision that's made in real time, whether a person watching an interview, for example, can reliably, objectively measure that difference. So a criterion like level of detail, right, is a statement detailed, is that something that somebody can reliably measure in an interview setting? Uh, so, you know, and beyond that, they're not merely interested in how significant that difference is, they're interested in how likely it is that that difference will show up when you expect it to and not show up when you don't. In other words, what's its predictive power? Deception researchers, the first group that I was talking about, they've studied hundreds of factors, hundreds of ways that liars and truth tellers might behave differently. And when lie detection research look, researchers look out across this body of evidence, 
what they see is that the significant differences that have been identified are only weakly significant. And not one of these factors reliably shows up when you expect it to and doesn't show up where you don't. Which may help to explain why in hundreds and hundreds of studies across decades, and there are two big meta studies of this recently that, that were really quite compelling, they've shown that consistently our ability to detect lies in these kinds of settings is just slightly better than a coin toss. It tends to be about 54% globally. <laughs> And so one of the big problems with these top five lists is that they wrongly equate statistical significance with predictive power. So a statement, let's say this statement is true. Many studies have shown that liars are significantly more likely than truth tellers to gesture with their hands. Let's say. Um, um, even if that statement is true, that factor, looking to see how often somebody's gesturing with their hands to decide whether they're lying or not, right? that may have little to no predictive power. If, for example, many other studies have found the opposite or have found no correlation. Okay? But even, even let's say that it's a, it's a consistent finding. So studies have consistently found that it's a significant difference. Well, if you can't reliably measure it, for one thing, that's going to be a problem. Right? People who try to rely on this are too misled by other subjective factors that they can't keep that factor sort of front and center, that'll be a problem. But even let's say it's a, it's a factor you can reliably measure, you're still left with the fact that if these statistically significant differences are still minute, right, if they're just slightly more likely than random chance to be showing up, then you're just slightly more likely than a coin toss to get it right if you're relying on that factor, which may help to explain globally why we're so bad at this kind of thing. So the red flag approach, the sort of looking for red flags, uh, is, is you know, kind of, I think, generally panned. Uh, but one step removed from that is a, a method that's called the baseline approach. And the baseline technique is a common denominator in a lot of police questioning. Ba baseline methods um, give up on the idea that there are reliable indicators across the population sample, which is a good thing. But they focus instead on how one particular person acts. And they try to compare how that person acts when they're relaxed versus how they act when they're stressed or when they're sort of being asked difficult questions. And the idea here is that you can figure out what, how someone normally acts and then spot their tells. Right? You can see what the signs are that they're not telling the truth. And this approach has been described by psychologists as one of the most striking misuses of social science evidence. because. Anybody is going to be more nervous when they're being asked the hard questions than they are when they're being asked the easy questions. And the best research suggests that liars and truth tellers behave comparably differently in neutral and high stakes situations. And I have a great Bill Clinton story, but you can ask me about that <laughs> in questions. <laughs> so moving on to what lie detection researchers are working on now that you know, is actually fairly promising. Uh, the f uh, there are two sort of bodies of research that look like they might be fairly promising. The first is essentially a much more uh, sophisticated take on the Facebook top five lists. The idea here is that, yes, you know, every one of these very weakly significant factors on its own is weak. But if we could find a way to aggregate them and look at them together, we might be able to come up with something that's stronger than the sum of its parts. And so there are numbers of methods that train people in sort of very uh, sort of measured analytic ways to look for bundles of these weak indicators. And the idea is that you can combine them in an analysis that sort of combines measurements and gives a stronger outcome. And so a couple of points here is researchers aren't just saying to assessors, you know, go into the hearing and keep your eyes open for this factor or that. They're, ha they're training them on how to look for these factors after the fact. Right? So a, a factor like level of detail, for example, isn't just this sort of impression on the spot of how detailed the story is. They will sit down and they will count adjectives and adverbs and go through an entire statement and come up with some metric. And it takes weeks to train people in this. But when these kinds of tools, some of the best of them, if they're used by people who are well trained in them and know how to use them, Someone can get up to about a 70% accuracy rate, at least. And the studies that have been reported, there have been reported studies of 70% accuracy, which is a whole lot better than 54. You're still getting it wrong about one time out of three, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's an improvement. Um, the second approach focuses on how to gather evidence so as to amplify these sort of minute differences that, that the researchers theorize are there. So 
this idea is drawing on that theory that um, liars have to work harder than truth tellers. And so the idea is that people will have their subjects tell a story while doing something that makes it just a little bit harder, like tell it backwards or draw a picture while you're narrating it. And the hope is they're trying to find that sweet spot where somebody will, a truth teller won't have that much more trouble doing it, but it'll just tip a liar over and keep them from being able to keep their story straight. Mm -hmm. And again, the results are sort of similar. Uh, that about 70% accuracy among people who are really well trained in these methods. So what are the problems with using these methods in a refugee hearing, apart from you know, resources, expense and time and all of that, leaving all that aside? The kinds of factors, those, those factors, those flags that these methods are still <coughs> looking for, uh, are factors that if you go back to what I was saying at the beginning of those two underlying theories, they're all things that are really uh, proxy indicators, right? They're not indicators of deception. They're indicators that someone is either stressed and anxious and afraid, more than you would expect them to be, or that they're having trouble telling their story because they're working very hard to tell it more than you would expect them to be. And these observations are what in turn lead researchers to conclude that they're lying based on those grounding theories. So, you know, some researchers, first of all, aren't persuaded by those grounding theories at all. But let's say for the sake of argument that we are, and we think that the research strongly supports them in the populations that have been studied, which is to say, you know, in the context in which they've been studied, so North American undergrads primarily, but there have also been some studies with criminals, there have been some studies with children. You know, let's go even further and sort of wildly conclude that these underlying theories are likely true for all people everywhere, in all cultures, in all contexts, right? In every aspect of daily life. If we were willing to make that much of a leap of faith, we'd still bump into the fact that refugee hearings are an anomaly. And they're an anomaly because there's just no reason to assume that a lying refugee claimant will be more anxious and afraid and nervous and stressed than a truthful one, right? A truthful claimant has more at stake in a hearing than a liar does. There's also no reason to assume that a lying claimant will have to work harder to tell their story. Right? It might be much easier to tell a made-up story about having been raped than to tell the real story. Um, to say nothing of all the other factors that could be causing static in the data, like trauma and mental health issues, of course problems with cross-cultural communication, fatigue, interpreters, and even where claimants are testifying in English, the studies that have looked at this factor suggest that we're more likely to disbelieve somebody if they're testifying in their second language, possibly because they have to work harder. So they'll show some of those same indicators, like taking longer to answer questions or fumbling a bit. So take all of that into account, and you're dealing with a population in, a, in an environmental context that is so different from you know, at the level of those grounding theories from any of the populations that have been studied, that there's just no empirical basis to conclude that any of the lie detection research transfers to a refugee.